edition of Catfish Weekly, along with Paul Ragsdale, Chris Wallace, Chuck Davison. I'm Lyle Stokes, and tonight we have the pleasure of a special guest speaker, Brian Cannaday from the Missouri Department of Conservation, head of Fisheries Department. But before we get to Brian, Paul has a little something he wants to go over with everybody first. Paul? Oh, yeah, I almost forgot about that, Lyle. Appreciate it. Um, I've got the... Uh, uh, the giveaway people that sent in all their keys, and let me find it here. I ended up having to reboot my, my computer, so um, I'm going to switch over to screen share so you can all see exactly what I'm doing. I want to make sure that there's no way anybody's going to say it's a uh, the good old boys. So um, let me get here. Okay, here are the five names of the people that sent all the keys in. Hey, and Paul. Before you uh, before you keep going right now, nobody can watch us live because you haven't updated the link on the Catfish Weekly for the live video feed. Oh, I guess I need to do that, don't I? Um. God, I, I, we, we've had technical difficulties tonight, so. so we Why don't we just go ahead with Brian while you're getting that stuff ready? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Brian Kennedy is uh, Chief of Fisheries with Missouri Department of Conservation. Brian, welcome to the show tonight. Well, I'm really glad that you guys uh, had me on. I've uh, been looking forward to it. Uh, anytime we get a chance to talk about fish, we're, uh, we're pretty excited. Yeah, that's awesome. We've got uh, some new regulations in the state of Missouri on Lake Ozark and Truman Lake. Um, would you mind going over those with with everybody here briefly, so we know what we're up against? We're we're also excited about having these regulations and uh, protecting the breeding size fish. That uh, if you wouldn't mind, give us a brief rundown. Sure. What what we uh, you know we we manage fish populations all over Missouri, not just game fish, but our, our non game or non sport fish as well. But, uh, catfish is our number one cat, our number one species uh, for anglers in the state of Missouri, and so during some of our work on Lake Ozark and on Truman, what we noticed is that we were having a pretty high harvest rate, and the fish in those lakes grow relatively slowly. And what we were seeing was a, a population that was being harvested faster than it can reproduce, or faster than it can sustain itself. Uh, frankly, we had a 92% harvest rate, and that's that's way over what you know that population could sustain on its own. And so what we've done is we've worked with the citizens of Missouri and the anglers and others that have an interest, and we've enacted a slot length limit uh, that went into effect yesterday on March 1st uh, after a lot of, I mean, several years of working with our public and public meetings and comments and those kinds of things. But what we've done is we've just, We've decided to enact a protected slot length limit for blue catfish in particular between 26 inches long and 34 inches long. And what I mean by that is fish can be harvested from 0 inches all the way up to 25 and, you know, uh, almost 26 inches. And then fish between 26 inches and 34 inches have to go back in the water so they can grow to that breeding size or grow to that bonus or trophy size fish for us. And then fish over 34 inches can be kept as a part of the harvest as well. So there's a window in there that we want those fish to be able to stay in the population, continue to breed, and grow to a you know a relatively larger size, uh, and uh, you know, provide somebody that fish of a lifetime. So I think this is a good balance. It still allows for those people that want to catch some fish to take home. It allows them to do that uh, on the uh, you know the zero to 26 inch side. In Missouri, in those two lakes, that's about a seven-pound fish if you get a 26-inch uh, blue cat. Uh, and then if you do happen to catch a couple of large fish, we are allowing two fish per day over 34 inches as part of that part of that creel. That's outstanding. We've been pushing for these regulations statewide, but we got to start now with having them uh, on on the two lakes down south. And uh, something that comes to my mind is you're actually allowed to now to keep more fish. You can keep 10 fish instead of the five previously. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. In the past, it was just a five fish per day daily limit per licensed angler. And what we've 
see is we, you know, we've got good reproduction there. Uh, you know, we've got a, a, a fairly large number of fish in that smaller size rate. So what we did, and this, this sounds kind of different, but it, I mean, our science is very solid on this. We, we base all of our decisions on sound science. Um, we're allowing anglers to take more fish on the, on the small end of that, reducing the amount of competition that's there for those that actually end up staying in the lake. Uh, can grow quicker to that larger size. And so uh, what we've found, we've, we've had similar regulations on black bass and several other species in the state of Missouri uh, where we've had some very good success with that, where we're, we're trying to manage these fish for all Missourians, not, not just the tournament anglers, not just the recreational angler, but just all Missourians. And this regulation like this will allow some fish to grow large and allow people to take some fish out to take home for dinner uh, and allow, you know, uh, of course, a lot of recreational and uh, fishing to, to go on and not hurt the population at all. So, yeah, we, we've increased that creel or the amount of fish people can take home. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I think with these protections, uh, we'll start seeing some larger fish come out the other end. And, you know, as a lifelong angler myself, of course, I want to catch more and larger fish. So, Well, I tell you, I'm really excited about this. We've, we've been trying to get something like this for a long time. And, and uh, as we all know, Missouri has one of the most respected conservation departments in the United States. And uh, personally, I think a lot of the, the uh, outlying states are uh, on the border of getting something like this done. And they're kind of waiting to see what Missouri does because uh, as normal, we lead by example. And, and I think that they're all taking notice to, to what we're doing. Um, one thing, Brian, if you don't mind, we have uh, a lot of listeners that fish the river systems, and I know before the show is over or shortly after, we'll start getting emails and PMs and messages about what's going on with the rivers, and I, and I know because I visited with you that, that there is studies in the works and things going on to see if we really need to get the, the restrictions on, on the, the Mississippi and the Missouri River, even though the commercial fishing is not allowed in Missouri, there's still a lot of fish taken out of there and harvested every year. Could you give us a little uh, rundown on what's going on on the river systems at this time? Yeah, you bet. Uh, we, we manage each body of water in the state of Missouri uh, to its fullest potential. So uh, you, you see very few just blanket statewide regulations in Missouri. Uh, a lot of times we'll have lake-specific or river-specific regulations because each body of water is just a little bit different. Uh, it has the potential to do more. And so one of the things we, we have done, we've had commercial fishing in Missouri, both on the Mississippi and the Missouri River up until about the ni early 1990s. Uh, then it was banned on the Missouri River. It's still out on the Mississippi. And what we've seen, especially on the Missouri River, we've seen that population rebound, uh, you know, where, again, catfish are our number one sport fish in Missouri if you combine blue cat, flathead, and, and channel cat. And we're seeing some, some good numbers rebound uh, on the Missouri River. We're also seeing some very large fish uh, come back into that population. And so uh, one thing that we found is that, uh, you know, we, we want to make sure we're trying to manage these populations for their, their you know, best uh, potential. We want to be able to increase the yield or increase the number of fish available, not only for the recreational angler, but for the commercial angler on the Mississippi River. And, uh, you know, what we, we just didn't have good information to be able to make those decisions right now, especially on the larger fish. So we have a, a project that's starting this year. It'll start this spring uh, when the ice is off and, you know, our guys can safely get out there, where we are going to focus on different sizes of fish in the Mississippi River and try to, try to find out what that standing stock is, what's out there, uh, find out if we can and it, it, what kind of regulations might need to be in place to protect some of those fish uh, for breeding purposes and for, you know, to keep that population uh, being self-sustaining. And so, uh, you know, we try to base all of our decisions on sound science uh, because, frankly, that's what our public expects of us. And, and we're, uh, we're, just, we're just starting off on that. And what we may, uh, I obviously, all of your listeners and, and all, each one of you are going to hear more about this as we go on, but one of the things we need to look at is the age of these fish. And uh, the best way to do that is to uh, uh, take a bony structure out of the fish, like a fin or, or a, pardon me, a spine or something. So what we might have to do or what we will do is work with those uh, recreational anglers that might decide to harvest a fish and, uh, you know, get a, get a spine from them, uh, you know, get a length and a spine.
online and other things and, and be able to get some information from those folks. And that way we've got our public, our angling public, helping us with this study, um, uh, you know, when we get down right down to it this spring. So, you know, we're, we're really focused on, uh, on catfish in Missouri. We, we look at them uh, statewide all the time. And, uh, you know, I, I, to be able to effectively manage those populations on the large rivers, we just need a little bit more information. And, uh, you know, we're looking for uh, folks to come along with us and help us with that. I know uh, several years ago, um, Kevin Sullivan uh, invited me to help do a study on Truman Lake. Uh, I was happy to do so. We put a lot of fish in the boat that year, and, and uh, we, we was up there several times a week uh, fishing, and, and it was a great deal to, to be a part of that study. So I know anyone that you choose will be happy to help you out with. One thing that that you mentioned just a second ago is the fact that in the state of Missouri, catfish is known as a sport fish, and I know that that's not um, uh, true in all states. A lot of, some states don't classify catfish as a sport fish uh, as we do, uh, but it, 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 my understanding, and I know that this is correct, but you can confirm it for me, that the catfish, uh, channel cat, blue cat, and, and flatheads are the number one sport fish in the state of Missouri. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, it, it's, it's big business for us in Missouri from a recreational standpoint, but it's really big business to our economy. You know, in Missouri, we're lucky. We've got about 1.2 million anglers statewide, fish for all species. They fish about 16 million days a year, uh, and that contributes about $12 billion uh, to uh, the economy of the state of Missouri, not just fishing. That's fishing, forestry activities, wildlife-related activities. If you wanted to get specific down into catfish fishing, uh, some studies that we've done with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, when we look at uh, numbers in, for Missouri, uh, catfish fishing in Missouri contributes about $157 million to the economy of the state of Missouri. So from a, we, we don't work uh, for that to, to increase the economy. It's a nice side benefit. But what we have seen is when we take a very active role managing populations, fish populations, for uh, you know, to their maximum potential, what we see is that that draws anglers to a lake, that draws anglers to the river. Those anglers have to buy gas, they have to buy bait, they have to stay in hotels, they have to buy food. Uh, you know, that it, it, it can actually uh, be quite beneficial to have a very healthy fish population in a reach river or in a reservoir. And, you know, you don't. It, you, you know, if you think about those folks around Lake of the Ozarks or down around Table Rock Lake or Lake Taney Como, which is a wildly popular rainbow trout fishery for us, um, you know they would they would uh, they'd be singing the praises of a healthy fish population because they've they've seen the benefits and um, you know not to get too far away from catfish, but we're working on a striped bass population down at Bull Shoals in combination with Arkansas, and uh, you know that's to that's to help maximize the potential of that particular reservoir. But our our locals down there, the the resort owners and the uh, guides and then the other recreational anglers are chopping at the bit for those fish to to get into that. Pardon me, get into that system and be ready for uh, you know ready for folks to catch. And we've been seeing these big fish coming in uh, on uh, Facebook and on pictures and and uh, letters. Uh, these big catfish coming in from the Mississippi and from the Missouri. Got a lot of catch and release anglers, and so we want to you know we want to see what we can do to to increase those numbers uh, for all of our anglers. Yeah, that's awesome. We, um, I've actually done personal studies myself and contacted people in Alabama and Mississippi and Tennessee, places where they already had 34-inch rules and slot limit fish on, on catfish, and, and the guides are just books months in advance, and all the convenience stores and motels are full, and everybody's happy about that, so I know that that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, I don't want to take up the whole show, and I know that Paul and and uh, Chris and and uh, Chuck have all got a couple of questions. So I'm at this point, I'm going to let Paul ask you a couple of things, and uh, then we'll get sure. back, and I'll visit with you here again in a second. Hi, Paul? how you doing? Um, Hi there. I guess what what I'm curious: Do you think that it would be a help that if the uh, the tournament trails would um, measure away and and uh, Tag the fish and release them, or yeah, I think it could be very beneficial uh, for to get some weights and lengths from some of the tournaments. I don't, I, I'm not as familiar with the catfish tournaments. I've only been to one, 
and we in that particular tournament it was total weight. Um, you know, and you know if we could get some individual fish lengths and weights, those are, that's a lot of the information that we uh, we need to help uh, you know get information about the growth rates of those fish and those kinds of things, and it would be helpful. Um, hey, you know, I, I really see the the tournament anglers as being great advocates uh, for not only just fishing but catfishing in particular. And it's really come on strong in Missouri the last, oh, I would say, oh, seven to ten years. We're starting to see a lot more attention on that because folks are able to actually, you know, catch a few large fish, especially in our large rivers. And so, I think there's a lot of uh, potential partnership there between the tournament anglers and and the department, uh, much in the way there is with our recreational anglers now, um, to share information and get advice. And you know, because you guys are out there every day, uh, we've got. A lot of our staff that, that are big time fishermen uh, over in the St. Louis area, and they they can tell us a lot of information as well. And so what we do is we take those bits of information, much in the way you look at a pieces of a puzzle, and we put them together uh, to form our uh, information to make good decisions, informed decisions about regulations. Paul, before you go with this next question, I'd like to invite Brian. Uh, to Warsaw the night there, uh, Kansas City Catfish is putting on a, a really big tournament down there. And um, if you care to come down, we know we'd love to have you down there. It's going to be an outstanding tournament with somewhere in the 50 to 80 boat range, and it would be a great time to see what what the, the fishermen, the, the tournament guys do as far as preserving and have live wells and how they take care of their fish, and, and it would really be a good, good thing to, to see. Yeah, you bet. I, I look forward to it. Yeah, that's pretty well uh, all I had other than doing the uh, drawing real quick. So you want okay. to let me do that real quick. And then, go uh, ahead and do that, and then we'll get with Chris and let uh, Chris talk to, to Brian. Him finish off, and then uh, we'll uh, do this month's giveaway. But uh, what I'm going to do here is... Um, I'm going to go to a uh, screen share so you can see everything that I'm doing. And uh, so you'll see exactly how, how we do the drawing. I'm going to copy these. These are the five people who send me, sent me all the correct keys. Uh, Matt Lamb, Terry Wendemey, uh, Terry Ronald Workman, Jeremy Gregg, Rob Gregg. And uh, those are going to go into... Uh, random.org and I'm sure you can all see this if, if you can't see it let me know now okay I got it but uh, I've got all the names listed uh, in random.org now I'm going to spin it three times I mean I'm going to click three times to make it scramble the names on the third time whatever whoever is up there at the number one spot uh, wins the Akuma Classic XT Reel. And we're going to go one, two, and three. And the winner is going to be Matt Lamb. So, uh, Matt, if, if you get a chance, send uh, an email to paul at catfishweekly.com and give me your address and we'll get that sent out to you. And I will switch it back over to... Uh, if I can get it to quit here. There we go. So uh, go ahead, Chris, or, or Lyle. That's all I needed. All right, Brian. Um, sure. How are you doing? I'm doing great. All right. Got a little questions for you here. Um, sure. As, as we spoke earlier, I told you I'm in the Indiana area, and you know we have the Ohio River, which is a shared river between Indiana and Kentucky, and we have a, we have a lot of of conservation efforts and things going along. If if you didn't know already, um, we do. <laughs> so we got a lot of things going that we're trying to do to help protect the catfish in the waters around us. Um, both also working with Indiana and the inland fisheries as far as well as the uh, the shared river of, of the Ohio. Um, so starting off with. My first question, I would ask, what influence did the other states' data that they've got, or, or current laws where they're protecting catfish or whatever, have on your decisions um, for making you know, the future regulations that you have now or the future regulations that you're going to have? 
for catfish. It does have some influence on it, and uh, especially in our what I would call our interstate waters, like the Mississippi River. Um, what we want to do is, you know, what, like I said earlier, we try to base our well, we don't try to, we do base our regulations based on sound science information we've collected and we've shared with other states. They've shared our data, you know, their data with us. What we want to try and do is make things as consistent as possible for those anglers that would fish, say, the Mississippi River, you know, that border water. Um, so what we've done is we've worked with the states of Illinois, Tennessee, Kentucky, on things like sturgeon, and, and we're working on paddlefish now. Our paddlefish regulation is just a little bit different. Uh, in the river, and so we're working to see how close we can come to that. Um, so, you know, there's when we get information from those neighboring states, uh, we share as much as we can with them, they share with us. Uh, I, I would say that, again, that's one of those pieces of the puzzle that we'll want to take a hard look at. Uh, our biologists from all those states, uh, state of Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, all of them, you know, they, they talk, they work with each other. We have very similar systems, both in reservoirs and, and rivers, and so yeah, there's certainly uh, there's certainly got a lot of good information being shared. So there is some influence there. Um, doesn't mean it'll be perfectly consistent across the board. Pardon me, but uh, but there is certainly an opportunity. If there's an opportunity to do that and it meets our goals for our citizens, then we certainly want to do it to make it as simple as possible for the anglers that are out there. Yeah, I do know that like one of the problems that we faced, and you probably had that same issue as well is when when you go to make changes in, in regulations and things like that at least along this area that there's not a lot of research to go back to and compare against you know from from uh, a back date you know to, to compare against today you know as far as numbers and sizes right. and things like that so um, that's the one thing that Kentucky and Indiana I guess has at least started to do now is showing up at the tournaments getting those uh, weights and measurements from all the fish and and at least starting a, a track record for you know to be able to look in the future and see if any changes that they do right now have an, an effect in the future so yeah and it's, it, it does take a little time but uh, you know most of us are I just admit it uh, we're, we're pretty conservative uh, because it, it's it's a rather difficult process to get through regulations, but it's a very necessary and very needed process, and so it, it does take a little bit of time. But uh, you know, once we once we've got our information straight, uh, once we've got our information in hand, then uh, you know you won't find a harder, a better cheerleader for it. We'll get you know we get uh, through our regulations process through uh, citizen input, uh, you know, collecting a lot of information from folks and. And then go ahead and get the regulations implemented. But uh, you know, I, I'm glad to hear that those folks are, are also taking it seriously and and working with uh, the anglers. I think that's the only way we can all move forward. Yeah, we um, I, I, the commercial fishing in on the Missouri was was banned in the '90s. Um, do you see it being banned on the Mississippi in the near future? And what effect did re removing the commercial fishing industry from that area? versus the money that comes in, I guess, from uh, tourist dollars or whatever. What, what kind of effect do you see there? Is it, does it offset better for the, the fishing industry versus the commercial guys that were there? Yeah, you, you know, what we try to do in Missouri is we try to look at the fishery for all citizens. We've got about six, nine citizens in Missouri, so we try to manage these fish populations for the most people. <laughs> And uh, you know, there's a there is a commercial fishery on the Mississippi, on the Missouri. It was it was banned due to low numbers of catfish. That was the commercially viable species that they were fishing for on the on the Missouri. Uh, it was a 15 inch minimum length limit, and the numbers were just dropping off like crazy. We just weren't seeing the fish. And so when we banned uh, commercial fishing, it did. It took a while. It took about 15 years. I remember, catfish are fairly long lived species. It took about 15 years before we started seeing this population rebound, uh, both in blue cat and flathead and channel cat for that matter. Uh, but we're there now. Uh, we're starting to see very large fish in there. We're starting to see good numbers. On the Mississippi uh, and, and in Missouri, we have about 340 miles of the Missouri River in the state. So we have the ability to have control over that. On the Mississippi, it's a little bit uh, more of a tangled web when you've got uh, multiple states involved in the discussion. Uh, I don't. I'm not aware of any discussions right now to actually ban commercial fishing uh, of any kind for for catfish. <laughs> Pardon me, but uh, you know, certainly looking at uh, sustainable regulations, things that uh, would make the population sustainable on a 
its own without any kind of stocking or anything. But those are the kinds of things we do all the time. And that may require regulations changes, uh, you know, protecting some of those fish to allow them to grow. Uh, it may require uh, the amount of fish, you know, the creel, how much they can take may require a change in that or maybe a season. Uh, certain times of the year they can't fish or something like that. So there's lots of different things. And what we've been, what we've done over the last two years in Missouri is we've really reached out to our commercial fishermen. We sell about 300 permits a year statewide in Missouri. Very few of those folks actually fish on the Mississippi River for uh, for catfish. Most of them have other species in mind. However, having said that, along the Mississippi, you've got you know the state of Illinois, Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas. Uh, you know, there's there's other states, Iowa, and other states that are involved in the discussion. So uh, we continue to work with those folks, build a dialogue with them, build a relationship with them uh, to try and uh, and, you know, to see what we can do to improve that catfish fishery for for everyone in this case. Uh, um, and you know, of course, our focus is uh, recreational anglers. All right. Um, I you know Missouri. You know, you were talking with Lyle about Missouri had had classified all three species of catfish as game fish, and uh, I I absolutely I, I love the fact that you've done that. I'm, I'm hoping that. Other states will will get on board with it. Um, if you if you look across the board, I, I I'm pretty sure that catfish are normally in the top five of just about every state in the U.S. So I mean they're they're very they're very fished for. Um, you know the the, the audience, the target, uh, the fishermen more going to it. You know it's it's a growing field. Um, but for other states like Kentucky and Indiana where the catfish are not uh, considered game fish, I know you can't speak for them, so I guess my question would be, what was it that helped your state classify them as a game fish so we could help that process along in our current states or, or states that, you know, want to get this classified as game fish? Sure. It, it's popularity of the species. Uh, you know, that, that's what's done it. And this was, this was set into action. Oh, just decades ago, catfish have always been a sport fish in Missouri. Um, of all all three of the species, um, you know, it's 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 just, just it is by far the most popular uh, fish we have. There's it kind of goes back and forth between what we call our black bass, which is large mouth smallmouth spotted bass, and catfish. But over the last few years, catfish has ridden above that and risen above that and and, and maintained that. It's a uh, it's a wildly popular fish. They grow in all different habitats in Missouri. They can be caught statewide, and uh, you know it's just it's a popular uh, species that we we actively manage for those populations due to their popularity. So, you know, I, I guess if I you know I, I couldn't uh, speak for the other states, but you know I would uh, I would encourage those folks that have an interest, like you and your and your listeners and your readers, I would uh, have them. You know, begin that conversation with those states and, and let folks know just how important uh, catfish are to you. Um, you know, we, we've got that message out of Missouri. Uh, we firmly believe that as a lifelong angler, I'm a, I'm a big blue cat fisherman and flathead cat fisherman. Um, I live just a few minutes off of the Missouri River myself and, and get out there every chance I get. So, uh, you know, catfish are a big deal for us in Missouri. And I, I'm confident that they are in the other states as well. But uh, probably the very first step would be to continue to have that dialogue with your state fish and wildlife agency and make sure that they're listening to you, make sure they're hearing you, that, that you know you believe catfish need the, that kind of respect or that kind of protection of, of a game fish. I, I definitely I feel as if you know like just in the poll results that most of the DNR always have with the with the fact that. You know, I believe in Indiana and Kentucky, like I said, the catfish, you know, within two of the three species are normally in that top five list. I think that that alone is, is telling them that, you know, we want catfish protected and that we are fishing for that fish as a sport fish and we're treating it as a game fish. But I, the response in the Kentucky and Indiana, you know, DNR has been a little resistant with us, so I just didn't know if maybe there was anything else besides the popularity of the anglers that would help us get that fish classified, if you know what I'm trying yeah. to say. 
Yeah, there's there's nothing I can think of right offhand. One thing that a group of school kids did right now. We just got started. Thing is, they actually designated the catfish as our state fish. Um, kids learning about the legislative process got uh, uh, at the state level got uh, the year of a legislator and and actually deemed uh, catfish as our state fish in Missouri. So uh, maybe something like that might help. It was. We kind of we kind of looked funny at that at first, but you know what it did was it gave us a great platform to talk about how important catfish are to us. So yeah, I I do believe Indiana started the, uh, the, the state catfish or the state fish. Sorry, go ahead. I know those folks do in their states as well, and so I, I just I really encourage you to keep that uh, open dialogue with those uh, fish chiefs and those uh, those agencies. Uh, I know both the, the chief in Indiana and in Kentucky and and uh, you know, I, I know they would uh, love to hear from you, and they, would, you know, they'll do what they can to, to work with you. Yeah, we, we definitely have. We've opened up dialect with both Indiana and Kentucky, and and I, and I believe that we're moving in the right direction. But I, you know, of course, as an angler, we always feel like it's slower than we would like. You know, and I know you you understand sure. that. <laughs> Yeah, I lost my ear, Brian. Brian, the the regulations that we've got in effect now on the on the lakes, um, can can you um, enlighten us a little bit on about how long that studies takes to get something like that put in place? We started to yeah, that's a great question. We started talking uh, about this in real, uh, kind of a serious way, uh, based on some work that we did starting in two thousand three. We had a study going on uh, from 2003 to 2009 that really verified that we had a really high harvest rate of those intermediate and large sized blue catfish on Truman. Um, these are fish over, you know, 24 inches, um, and you know, it, it's it's it was a 92 percent angler harvest rate, and that's that's just unsustainable. You know, over time that population would crash, probably quicker than not, and so. Uh, about 2009, we started having uh, public meetings, conversations, uh, started getting stuff in our conservationist magazine, um, had a round of public meetings, uh, five public meetings down in the area, uh, met with local angler groups, met with the marina owners, the resort owners, um, all the media that we could, bait shop owners, those kinds of things, uh, local chambers of commerce, all kinds of things to try and you know, get information from them. That started back in about 2010, I'd say, in earnest. Uh, based on that input, based on listening to the, the public and what they told us, we actually modified our ideas, modified our regulations proposal, uh, bumped up the minimum length on the on the bottom end of the slot. We were thinking more of like a 24 to 36 inch slot to protect those fish. We ended up cutting a couple inches off both ends, kind of tightened up that slot a little bit based on the input we got from the citizens uh, during our open houses. We went back out to the public in 2012 and had three open houses uh, all across the, that part of the state, had, stuff, had comment cards out, we, we mailed stuff to people that we knew had an interest, reached out to the media there, had stuff in our magazine. And we uh, had a formal comment period then through our Secretary of State's office and uh, took all that information into consideration and then went ahead with our regulations. So um, citizens were very actively engaged. These were the anglers. These were the resort owners, uh, you know, the recreational anglers, those kinds of things, uh, in our discussions. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you, we didn't make everybody happy. Uh, you know, it's just really not possible to do that. But our, uh, our research, our sound science, and that citizen input uh, are the foundation uh, to what the Department of Conservation has done uh, when we manage populations of the citizens. And I feel like we did that very effectively here. And uh, that, that's why you see the regulation that's in place now with that uh, 26 to, to 34 inch slot, and then the change of the increase in the daily the daily limit. You know our our citizens told us they, they like to catch those fish, they like to harvest those fish up to around seven pounds. And, you know, based on our work, that's a fish up around 26 inches long. And so that that fit into our mold. And then we also heard that, you know, some folks, hey, what if we caught a really big fish? We might want to take that home and show mom and dad or, or take it home to feed our family. And 
So that 34 inch lean fish, that's why we allow two fish over that, that 34 inches per day um, in case someone does catch a big fish. You know, it's, it's hard for me to judge what would be the fish of a lifetime for somebody. That 34 inch fish may be the fish of a lifetime for a, a person. And so this regulation would allow them to take it home. Uh, what we're finding is most people don't. They're catching them and releasing them. But the way our regulation got uh, tweaked or modified allows for those folks that want to take some fish home for their fish fry, and it also allows some fish to grow to that larger size. And so I, I feel like it's a good balance of uh, kind of both camps, if you will, those folks that want to eat fish and those folks that want to fish for, you know, large fish recreationally. I think this regulation does that. I think it provides the protection that this species needs to grow to that large size and continue to reproduce and keep the population going, and it still allows for some harvest. So lock, stock, and barrel, it probably took us uh, pretty close to four years to get it through our entire process, and that's not uncommon. About three years is the average on a regulation change uh, for us in Missouri because we want to be very careful and very meticulous and very thoughtful about working with our public to make sure that they understand it so they'll comply. Uh, we also work with, our, of course, our enforcement arm to make sure that whatever's being proposed could actually be enforced and, and uh, you know, the law would be on our side with that. So uh, I think we found a good balance with this regulation and, uh, you know, if it proves to work out the way that we think it will, <laughs> we have the opportunity to do something like it and very similar to it in some of our other reservoirs like Mark Twain or, um, you know, some of our other reservoirs that are in Missouri or maybe even the rivers, depending on what we find out with our studies that are going on in the rivers. So we're always trying to find that balance if we can, and I think we've done it here on Truman and Lake Ozark. I, I would have to agree. Uh, Cindy and I drove down and uh, attended the meetings that you guys had. It was a very impressive showing, and uh, the amount of support for the new regulations was overwhelming to me because I really thought there would be a lot of resistance at the meetings and nearly everyone was on board. Now, not everyone, but nearly everyone that attended those meetings was on board with the change because they all believe that it's for the betterment of, of catfish conservation. Yeah, one of, one of the things that I, I wish I could get a picture to you guys, and maybe I can and you can get it posted up on your, on your site, we put, we mocked up a display of what a, what a, what a, a stringer would be. Uh, for uh, for that day, you know, if you if you went fishing there, you could keep up to ten uh, fish, uh, various sizes, you know, outside of the slot. And so we went ahead and had a, a full blown display. It takes a pickup truck to move this thing, but just that visual display. When people see that and they think they see that and they say, "Oh my goodness, I can keep that every day under right. this permit or under this regulations change," uh, it really takes the naysayers away. I mean, it's. It's a very impressive board, and a lot of you may have had a chance to see that at one of the public meetings. But I did. It was outstanding. That, that is a representative stringer of what you could take home if you wanted to. Uh, well, generally get on board right away when they see that. It's. it's, uh, I, it's I've seen it's, that display, and I've awesome. seen that display, like and it's very awesome. impressive. A, a one of the things that. that uh, mind of course, you're welcome you know, to share that with whoever you want to, but it's a. It was a good. Uh, it was a good display, and uh, we use it all the time over at the Capitol and uh, and with other folks that are asking questions. Once they see that, that's typically an easy. Uh, it's an easy way to understand what we're talking about. Yeah, I remember the display well, and one of the things that uh, that that hit me is that there was hardly anybody that would want to clean that amount of fish at one time. I mean, that, those those fish that you're allowed to keep yeah, on a daily a basis just massive. Yeah, I mean it's just massive. So, um, you know, you would get, if you had a fish fly with just the fish that's in that display, you could feed half a town. I mean that's just an outstanding uh, display of a beautiful catfish that, that would be legal to keep with the new regulations in place. Yeah, we we did a quick calculation that that'd be about 87 pounds of fish, and then uh, you get about a 50 percent yield when you fillet a, a catfish. Uh, 49 percent fillet or something like that, but about a 50 percent yield off that. So you're looking at about 44 pounds of, of flesh that you could take home, and you could sure feed a lot of people with 44 pounds of meat. So, uh, and that and well, that, that you could catch and keep, assuming that you ate those 44 pounds, uh, you could keep that every day, and you can keep every licensed angler could keep that. 
And so as we feel like it still offers the protection that we need to get those fish up there and still allows for people to take some fish home to eat them. And so um, I'll, I'll remember to do that tomorrow. I'll probably send it to you, Lyle. But feel free to share that with anybody. Uh, it's a very impressive picture, and it really tells our story. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, Chris, Paul, have you guys got anything else that you'd like to visit with Brian about? Um, i got one more. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, I talked to you uh, earlier while we were trying to set all this up, uh -huh. and uh, I, I hit on a subject that I don't really want to get too long on, but uh, I, I want you to, to let some of the people know, since I've been asked a question, um, why noodling isn't pretty well in, in every state. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. We, and we get that quite a bit in Missouri. Uh, uh, noodling or hand cooking is very popular. You see a lot of uh, TV shows now that, that highlight it. And we have uh, a group in Missouri that would like to legalize it here in Missouri. Uh, just for the record, uh, noodling or hand fishing has been illegal in Missouri since 1911. Uh, we did have a brief experimental uh, project or experimental permit in 2005 and 2006. And uh, what we found is that the fish were very vulnerable uh, at that time of the year when they're in their cavities. And what we try to manage for are uh, sustainable fish populations. And, uh, you know, what happens is that fish is in there guarding the nest, guarding the eggs. And when they're pulled off that nest, those eggs die really, really quickly. And, um, you know, when you do that over time and you're losing these nests or these clutches of eggs, uh, you're not putting new catfish into the into the system. You know, it's, they're not uh, being hatched and they're not recruiting into that population. So, <coughs> pardon me. Um, these hand fishermen, um, uh, noodlers, have a, kind of an unfair advantage, actually, when these fish are pulled up down on top of their nests. And, uh, you know, when they, they have that opportunity to uh, pull those fish off the nest and give us some problems. Plus, if they're going to harvest that fish, you know, a lot of these fish will run up into smaller tributaries uh, to, to spawn, and uh, pretty easy to remove those fish. Uh, you know, it's an issue of bear chase as well. Uh, on a rod and reel, uh, the fish has the opportunity to, to bite or not bite. When you're hand fishing, you're, you're literally forcing this thing to, to, to bite onto your finger or hand as out of, just out of reaction, and, and removing it off the nest just is going to hurt that population long term. And so... During our experimental season, uh, what we found is the exploitation rate or the harvest rate was pretty high. Um, you know, could have a significant impact on catfish numbers. And with catfish being a very popular sport fish, uh, our number one sport fish in Missouri, uh, we just didn't feel like we needed another method of take. And so we, we actually cut that study short and, and went back to uh, hand fishing as an illegal status. Uh, state of Iowa just recently reconfirmed <laughs> that uh, they will not allow hand fishing for catfish in Missouri. And uh, we're going to stick to our guns here. A lot of the other states that are around us that do allow hand fishing, uh, catfish aren't considered a sport of fish there. They're considered a rough or a trash fish. Um, and, you know, so they allow hand fishing. And we're just, we're just not in the, uh, we don't have that interest right now uh, to do that because catfish are very popular, very, uh, very desirable for us. And, we just want to we want to see those populations sustained for the long term, and we feel like uh, not allowing it is going to help us do that. Oh. Chris, um, yeah, Brian, I thought of two other things. Um, well, one sure. major thing: Do you have uh, the? I believe you do have the problem with Asian carp in, in your waters, correct? We do, especially on the Missouri and the Mississippi River, our large rivers. We, to our knowledge, we have. Big head carp in a couple of reservoirs, not the silver carp, the one that's jumping that you see on the YouTube or see out on the river when you fish. Uh, but but uh, silver carp and big head carp are both found in a lot of our major river systems. Okay, in your data and your research, have you have you at least noticed the um, cat recognize the catfish, especially the larger catfish, as a natural predator to those species of carp? We have, and uh, the gentleman, and his name eludes me right now, but the gentleman that caught the 130-pound blue cat uh, right there at the mouth of the Missouri River uh, from St. Louis, uh, and for a while it was the world record uh, blue cat, uh, which has since been uh, surpassed by a fish out in the east. Uh, but uh, uh, it is certainly still our state record. Uh, he caught that fish on a fillet, if you will, of a silver carp. Yeah. And what we have found with a lot of our serious anglers here uh, is that they're using big pieces of Asian carp as bait uh, for uh, fish, the way that they rig.
proceeding. And, uh, you know, I don't know that they would ever control the numbers, uh, yeah. but they're certainly working for us out there in the system, uh, eating uh, those smaller silver carp when they get the chance. Uh, it's just the only reason I asked is we had a uh, invasive species specialist, and um, they basically had stated in in the Indiana in the Ohio or the Ohio River, basically in Indiana, Kentucky, uh, the Asian carp had no natural predators. And and to my, you know, disagreement, I said that the the large catfish were a natural predator. While they would not control numbers by any means they they were definitely on the right side of the fence there to help with that population if anything so yeah and i think i can i can understand why they might say something like that that they don't have any natural predators mainly the, the asian carp and i and i've done quite a bit of work with that uh, particular uh, type of species in particular the silver and the big head carp and the, and the grass carp which is an asian carp as well um, they tend to grow relatively quickly uh, yeah. i mean actually very quickly for a fish and they very quickly get beyond uh, the gape size. And the gape is how big the fish's mouth is. And so, uh, you know, you see these Asian carp at 5 to 7 to 10 pounds, uh, the adults, um, it takes pretty good sized blue cat or flathead to eat them. And so I, I could see where someone would say, well, they don't have any natural predators. Uh, of the smaller sizes, you know, when they're growing up, certainly uh, the smaller fish can be eaten immediately. But uh, I do think that we, we've got some fish that are aggressive enough, big blue cats and flatheads, that would eat them if given the opportunity, but certainly not to the level of control. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was out of that flathead on Percy Creek that time down there by you, he was a, he was a monster. I bet he could have got a four or five pounder in his mouth. Yeah, well, I've, yeah that flathead can be two there pounds. Was, uh, there was one nine flathead caught the and that had a, that had a that was a very large fish. I had the opportunity to see that fish when it was alive, uh, and it was uh, it was a dandy. It would have eaten a pretty good sized uh, piece of bait, pretty good sized fish itself. And some of those large blue cats uh, just got a, a picture right before Christmas of a 91 pound blue cat that was caught and released down by the St. Louis Arch. Uh, that was a very impressive fish, and it would have it would have eaten a, a pretty good sized Asian carp if it was given the chance. Well, uh, Brian, I, I want to publicly state that, you know, even though I'm not from Missouri, you know, I'm in Indiana, you know, other states do look at what's going on in the catfish regulations from other DNR and, um, you know, from what I've seen and probably a lot of other people, yourself and your staff do a very, very good job of, of looking at what people want, you know, doing the research and, and, and taking the data and getting, getting what's feasible done. And, and helping out both, you know, the DNR, you know, getting regulations passed and getting the, the anglers what they would like to see done. So a big thank you for what you're doing over there. I do hope that, you know, some of the DNR and, and places around us can, can get with and really start to collaborate more together in what we would like to see done in these parts as well. So... Thank you very much. Well, I really appreciate that, and, and you know, we'll, we'll certainly do what we can to help. You know, everybody looks at their fisheries a little bit differently, and yep. you know, we're very, very fortunate. Much like all the other states around us, we're very fortunate that we have uh, just really top-level staff uh, that are very dedicated. Um, you know, I, this isn't really a job for these folks; it's their calling. Uh, you know, the passion, and the you know, you, the anglers are very passionate. Well, just about everybody that works. Uh, you know, in fisheries, uh, they're also lifelong anglers. Um, they believe in what they're doing. Uh, they want to make these things better if they can. They want to make it better than it was when they walked in the door. And, and so, uh, you know, that passion translates into their work. They're very meticulous, good scientists, uh, good biologists. And, um, we're certainly willing to share information with anybody that uh, has an interest. But I, I appreciate the kind of words, and I'll make sure to pass them on. Yep. Just... For, uh, I'm done for Brian with myself. Do you have anything I'd, else, I'd, Paul? I'd love to have you on again at some point if you'd ever be willing. <laughs> I'd be happy to. We, I, I tell you, we love talking fish. Um, I have the opportunity to work with lots of different fish in the state of Missouri. Great people all over. Um, you know, just this past weekend, and I'll put a plug in for this, our trout season opened uh, yesterday. Uh, we had thousands of people at our trout parks and out on our trout streams. 
We had great weather right before this storm that's coming in. We're getting hit pretty hard right now, but uh, you know it kicked off kind of that unofficial part of spring. So talking trout one day, big blue cats and others today. Uh, you know we're we're really passionate about fish. I'd love to love to have a chance to to meet with you guys on your show again anytime. You just let me know. All right, we'll do. And I I would like to you know if possible we might even try to get our Kentucky uh, you know chief fisheries guys on and, and see if we can't. Get a, a good show going around all three, you know, different states for the guys that are on this show as well. So as soon as we figure out the uh, technical difficulties, we'll yeah, have. we'll get all that figured out. <laughs> it was working fine this morning. You got you got anything for him, Paul? Uh, no, um, I want him to stay on for a second after we go off the air. And, sure. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, do okay, the. Well. Contest for March is from Whisker Wear Apparel, and what you have to do is go to our Facebook account, which is Catfish Weekly, put up a sign in front of you that says catfishweekly.com Whisker Wear Apparel, and take that picture. It has to include your face. Upload that to the, uh, the Catfish Weekly Facebook page. And that will be your entry into the contest for a uh, free hoodie, your, your choice of color, either uh, black or white, two koozies, and a sticker. So that's pretty well all I had with that. I'm back to you, Lyle. Okay, Brian, I want to thank you for being on the show tonight. Uh, since the last several years, I've been working towards catfish conservation. It's always been a part of, of a lot of tournament anglers, which I consider myself a tournament angler. Not that I'm all that successful at it, but we do do, do, do a lot of tournaments. Um, I have had a new outlook on life from the perspective of what you guys do. I've got to know you and, and Aaron and Chris and uh, uh Mr. Dames and uh, Kevin Sullivan and so many of the guys that work so hard at the Department of Conservation uh, to see what you guys go through to listen to guys like me that complain because we don't have regulations and then on the other hand you got guys complaining because they're too strict already and, and what you guys do is an outstanding job for the citizens of Missouri and we're so proud of you. Uh, just wanted to thank you guys for coming on the show and tell you that we appreciate everything that you do. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, and please, uh, please consider it always an open door. We would love to talk fish, and anything we can do to to help do that and share the message, we're willing to do it. That'd be great. We'll try and get you I, on again. And with with that, we're going to close the I, show I, for wait, tonight. Wait, one sec. Oh, okay. I, I did have the closing statement real quick. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, we just wanted to let everybody know here at Catfish Weekly that while we do have our own specific spon sponsors as individuals, that Catfish Weekly in no way is affiliated with one product or um, or a company or person or anything like that. We want everybody, no matter what you use as gear, if it's monster rod holders, if it's Driftmaster, if it's Renegade Tackle or you know catf or Catfish Gear USA, we don't care what you use. We are here for catfish alone. Just we want to know first and foremost that we are here just for uh, the sport of catfishing and to share information with everybody and we want everybody to enjoy the show call in be a part of it um, really just just want, want everybody to know that and we are all on the show in agreement with what I just said so it's Absolutely. out there and, and I Absolutely. will continue to tell everybody one other thing if everybody could remember this is the biggest tournament of the of the the month that I'm aware of will be in Warsaw Missouri put on by Brad Kilpatrick and Kansas City Catfish the weather looks to be outstanding for Sunday's tournament. Should be in the upper 50s in temperature, and I ex personally don't know, but I'm expecting 50 plus boats down there. So anybody that wants to watch a great way in and see some good fish turned in or compete in the tournament, please come down to Warsaw and jump in the tournament with us. And with that, we're going to close the show for the night. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>